Chapter 2 A Treat Worthy Tale The Alban Farm, Rogerstown, Meath County, Ireland, late Christmas morning, Friday, December 25th, 1722. Joyfully singing their way home, the Alban Quintet's harmonious crooning is abruptly interrupted. Oh, I can barely feel me hands. R.J. moans as he sets the birds to the ground, pumping his hands. Senior Snickers. "'Tis a shame. You should put em in your pockets. Mine are nice and toasty. Blowing on his hands, R.J. eyeballs him and barks. "'If only these birds would fit in me pockets.' Senior chuckles. With the discerning raise of his brow, James Jr. scolds. "'That's enough, da.' Then... To his nephew's dismay, he hollers, James, carry one of these birds. With an exasperated sigh, James the Third walks over and begrudgingly takes one of the birds and slings it over his shoulder. His uncle bends over to pick up the other, but William swoops in like the wind and snatches it up before he can reach it. Trotting away, he hollers, See you at home! Tipping his hat, his uncle shouts, Thank you, lad! With the turkeys no longer his responsibility, R.J. stuffs his hands inside his warm coat, moaning, Oh, much better. Me hands are so bloody cold. Senior snickers. Next time. I know, I know, da. Bring a dog. Pointing with his pipe, Senior chuckles. I always said you were the smart one. Cracking a half-smile, R.J. gives his father a one-armed side-hug and sighs. I love you too, Da. A short while later, they step into a clearing. As they do, Bailey House and the farm's massive barn come into view. William and his brother, who were each carrying a bird, start picking up their pace. As they close on the barnyard, James the Third glances at his older brother. When William gives him a raised brow, he flashes a sinister grin and races towards the house. Not to be outdone, William gives chase. His brother is nearly to the door when he catches up. Grabbing the back of his coat, William pulls him backward, shoving him aside. Blowing past him, he dashes up the stairs to the third-floor kitchen where their mother is waiting. When young James finally reaches the kitchen, Sarah is getting ready to start on the first turkey. Smiling from ear to ear, William is on the other side of the table with his arms crossed in a victory stance. Sarah dries her hands on her apron, then gathers her long blonde hair, tying it with a ribbon. With her hair no longer an issue, she takes the other bird from James and plops it on the table. When she looks up to find them both still standing there, she shoos them away, barking, If and you stay, I'm putting you to work. Now off with you. Without a word, the brothers disappear down the stairs and out of sight. Sarah Kanzi is a tall, blue-eyed beauty from a prominent family in Queensboro, just north of Meath County. As luck would have it, she and Robert John met at the wedding of her brother, Anthony Kanzi Jr. It just so happens the woman he married that day is R.J.'s younger sister, Mary II. After the hunt, Christmas becomes a rare day of relaxation for the men, while the same cannot be said of Sarah, whose work in the kitchen is just beginning. Bailey House, Alban Farm, Rogerstown, Meath County, Ireland, later that evening, Christmas, Friday, December 25th, 1722. As the lazy day rolls into early evening, the aroma of tasty deliciousness lofts through the air. It's a luring temptation, filling the halls of Bailey House. As each Alban catches a whiff, they are lured away from what they are doing and make their way to the third-floor kitchen. Although no one was called to dinner, everyone is sitting around the table. Watching Sarah make the final preparations, they know their waiting will soon be over. With everything and everyone in their proper places, Sarah places the last of the platters on the table and takes her seat. She gives Senior a nod, and he blesses the meal. With a hearty amen, the feast begins. 
As platters make their way around the table, they load their plates with Sarah's succulent fowl and all the trimmings, each feasting to their belly's delight. The comforting bouquet of baked goods, roast turkeys, and a hint of smoke from Senior's pipe in the fireplace lingers in the air as they merrily stuff their pie holes. With a look of absolute satisfaction, William wipes his face while swallowing a mouthful and says, Well done, Ma! Without question, your best Christmas feast ever! We thank you, son! Here, hears ring out around the table as mugs and spoons are raised in salute. I love! Never a feast so fine, R.J. praises. Outstanding, Sarah, her brother-in-law adds, saluting with his spoon. Oh, that's sweet of you to say. It really is. But let's be honest. You're only just saying it because, you know, you'd all be starving without me. Laughter breaks out around the table. And thank God for you, Sarah. The last thing Bailey House needs are a bunch of dead bodies laying about, Senior Billows. Stopping mid-bite, Junior comments. That's a little dark, da. With that morbid thought, a hush falls over the room, and Sarah shifts the conversation. William, I'll make you a parley. You keep bringing home birds like those, and I'll keep making them tasty. With a wink and a point of his finger, he replies. Now that's a bargain if ever I heard one, Ma. With its oversized fireplace and cooking hearth, the kitchen is always the warmest room in the house. The family often gathers there, especially in the evenings of the colder months. As such, traditional Alban Christmases are always spent gathered around the dinner table, telling stories and laughing by the glow of the fire, its warmth comforting, its dancing, crackling flames mesmerizing as those with stuffed bellies slip into comas under its trance. Remarkably, however, some are still sopping their plates with slabs of bread or nursing their beverages. In the case of Senior and his sons, that means a snort of whiskey in one hand and a slow-burning pipe in the other. The family gift exchange took place just before Sarah's amazing feast, and now the men are smoking and drinking the gifts they received. By the looks on their faces, the whiskey James Jr. gave his father is pairing nicely with the fine tobacco Sr. gifted R.J. Meanwhile, at the other end of the table, ten-year-old Elizabeth sits playing with the doll her mother made with help from her tailor brother-in-law, who at the moment is gently stroking a roll of beautiful red fabric draped over his lap, a much-appreciated gift from his eldest nephew. From the moment William handed it to him, he has been stroking it like a puppy. Gliding his fingers gently over the cloth, he says, This is some fine fabric. Where did you find it? Sopping his plate, William replies, In Dublin, when Da and I went to sell the last crop. In Dublin? I've been all over that town, and I've never seen so fine a cloth. Which shop were it in? Junior queries. Actually, it were a woman with a small cart. She were peddling in the streets, waving it all around for all to see. When I saw it, I knew I had to get it. I probably paid too much, but she looked like she really needed it. Nay, lad, you couldn't pay too much for a cloth such as this. You did good. Happy Christmas, Uncle. I'm glad you like it. Like it? I love it, James Jr. roars shoving the fine red cloth in his father's face excitedly. Just look at it, da! Senior, who is sitting next to him, yanks his head back, and with a wave of his hand barks, I can see! Seeing he is irritated, Sarah gets an idea, and in her sweetest voice says, Senior! Aye, he replies, shooing Junior away. With a warm, persuasive smile, she says, I were thinking. Before she can get another word out, R.J. leans forward with a sophomoric grin and chirps. Tell me, dear, this thinking then. Wide-eyed, she turns to him and replies, Aye? Does it make your head ache? In the blink of an eye, she jabs a finger in his face, barking. Careful, Mr. Alban, or baby Jesus won't be the only one sleeping with the sheep tonight. 
Chuckles fill the room as R.J. sheepishly retreats. Boring holes through R.J. with her eyes, she continues. I were thinking. Then she turns to Senior and says, You might tell us one of your stories. Instantly, Lizzie and James the Third chant, Story, 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 story. Waving for them to stop, Senior bows in his chair to Sarah, chuckling. All right, all right. But only if it keeps me from sleeping with the sheep. Sarah crosses her arms, giving him a hard stare. All right, all right. I'll tell a story. With a grand smile, Sarah nods victoriously, then moves to a side table to retrieve what her family have all been waiting for. Its sweet aroma wafting in the air as she places it in the middle of the kitchen table. It is her family's favorite indulgence. In a chorus of oohs and ahs, they lean in, intoxicated by mouth-watering whiffs of sautéed apples and splashes of Senior's favorite whiskey. It is sinfully scrumptious, and all are eager to indulge in its buttery perfection. Spooning a healthy portion into a bowl, Sarah declares, There's nothing better with one of your stories than Grandma's drunken apple bread and butter pudding. As she places the bowl in front of him, Senior leans in, taking a deep whiff, declaring, Now that's a trait worthy of a tale, William chants. Story, story! As the others join in, Senior slowly dips a finger into his pudding and just as slowly brings it to his lips, teasing them. Sucking the deliciousness from his finger, he rolls his eyes back with a satisfied sigh. Oh, delicious! Well done, Sarah. So, which story shall it be? Excitedly, his sickly seven-year-old grandson coughs. Tell the one about the cow. Shaking his head, Senior dismisses the shaggy blonde-haired lad with a wave and replies, I'm sorry, lad, but nay, I don't know who'll be telling that one. Little John drops his head in disappointment. Turning to his ten-year-old granddaughter, he asks, And... What say you, Lizzie? Swiping the blonde bangs from her eyes, she fixes her baby blues on him and says, I like the one when you and Grandma ran away. Straightening himself, Senior asks, You mean from England? Lizzie nods emphatically. Waving a finger excitedly, he declares, Now there's a good one. Good pick, Lizzie. Sitting back in his chair, Senior strokes his bushy gray beard eyeballing everyone around the table. Then, with theatrical flair, he leans forward and says, This one I call Leave in the Shire. It were an early summer morn on me parents' farm on the outskirts of Corndon, and for them who don't know, that's in England. The year were 1664, and I, I were a 22-year-old lad. Interrupting William blurts, Same as me! With a stank eyed glare, Senior chides, Well, congratulations, lad. You know how old you are. Now, if and you've nothing else. Embarrassed, William shakes his head. No, where were I? Oh, so, before milking the cow, I figured I'd sneak across our neighbor's field and slip into their barn to say good morn to me sweetheart. You see, I knew she'd be in there tending her chores. Raising a hand, Lizzie asks, Were Grandma and your sweetheart? Nodding, Senior gives her a wink and continues. And sure enough, when I slips in the back door, there she were. But no like I expected. You see, she were barreled over on all fours with her beautiful blonde locks falling over her face, coughing in a boken. Leaning forward, Senior looks around the table, raising a finger. I remember. I were just about to speak when the door slammed shut behind me. So bloody loud it were, it shocked the both of us. So startled, in fact, your grandma jumped clean from her shoes. But then, with true Anne Margaret style, she wiped her mouth on her sleeve, gathered herself, and casually turned around. The instant her baby blues saw it were just me, her false smile melted into a sigh of relief before plunging into utter despair. 
She fell to her knees, wiping into her hands. Not knowing what was ailing her, I cried. Mercy me, what's wrong, Anne? What happened? Sitting across the table with her doll, Lizzie murmurs. That's so sad. Why was she crying, Grandpa? With a tempered grin, he leans forward. If and you listen closely, I'm just about to tell you. Taking a deep breath, he turns to the others around the table. After I asked what were wrong, she kept crying and shaking her head. Then, just like that, she starts taking these deep, long breaths, during which, save the sound of her breathing, there were an uncomfortable silence. Not knowing what to do, I wrapped me arms around her. I mean, I could see she were in a bad way, and more than anything, I just wanted to help her. The thing is, I had no idea what were troubling her. And then it came. He's gonna kill me. Kill ya. Who's gonna kill ya? Me da. He's gonna kill me. Now I'm aware of her drunker da in his main street, but still, I couldn't imagine him killing anyone, especially no Anne. So I says, you must be exaggerating. Why on earth would you think such a thing? You've got to tell me. Leaning forward and pointing with his pipe, Senior whispers, Now here's the part where I say, Be careful what you wish for. For just then, she turns to me and in the most clarifying tone replies, Because, James, I'm bloody pregnant. Chuckles break out around the table. I were stone-faced, and all I could bring myself to say were, You're a what? As he tells the story, Senior puts on his best dumbstruck expression, elevating the laughter. That's right, I'm bloody pregnant, she barks. I started to speak, but she cut me off with the finger to me face and cried. And when he finds out, he'll be looking to kill the both of us. Now here's your grandma at her wit's end, and like an idiot, I says, How'd that happen? R.J., James Jr., and William break into a hearty chuckle, while Sarah just shakes her head, smiling. Through terrible eyes, she cries, And I just know he'll kill you. I thought to myself, Terrific! We're having a baby, but it'll be raised by wolves, because we'll both be dead. More chuckles break out. Kneeling before her, I knew she were right, but I shook those thoughts from me head. Whispering sweetly, I says, don't worry, love. Tis going to be all right. We'll get through this. Through desperate tears, she cries. But, James, what are we to do? Look in her square in the eyes, I says. Honestly, I haven't the slightest notion, but I'll figure it out. I always do. Truth be told, I had no bloody clue. All I knew were I needed some help, and at that very moment, what I really needed were time to figure things out. What I really needed were to speak with me folks. So, I says to her, I says, Hear me on, and I know it's a lot to ask, but for now, tis what we need to do. First, we cannot have your folks seeing it like this. If when they do, they're sure to ask questions. Second, I need you to be brave. Clean yourself up and get to milking that cow like you haven't a care in the world. And finally, go about your day like it were any other. Can you do that? Wiping her tears away, she sighs. I could try. Needn't to get out of there before someone spots me, I says. Good. And rest assured, I'll call on you later. By then, I'm sure to have a plan. But for now, I need to slip out of here before I'm seen. She gives me a nod, and I takes her face gently in me hands and kisses her on the forehead. Then I jumps to me feet and dashes away. Swinging his arms wildly, Senior pretends to run, bringing Sarah and the children to laugh. Across the field I run to me parents' farm, and when I enters the door, there stands me ma, the lovely Sarah Kenzie, serving hot cups of tea to me da, your great granda Robert, and his da. Your great great granda, John Willemai, each of em scratching their salt and pepper beards as they wait for their tea. Me white haired grandmother, Elizabeth Ann, were sitting at the table as well. 
Like a bloody fool, I dashes into the room, stammering, Mama, Da, I, I've something to tell you. I must have scared the Holy Spirit clean out of them, because all they did were stare at me, stone-faced, expressions of confusion covering their wrinkled and weathered faces. With bewilderment, my ma asks, What is it? Like an idiot, I froze, dumbfounded and silent. Staring me down, she says, Well? Seeing I were shook up, my da says, Sit down, lad, tell us what's ailing you. So, with beads of sweat forming on me forehead, I plops down at the table. Ma sets a cup of tea in front of me and sits down. For the next long minute, all I did was stare at that bloody cup. Finally, I gets me courage up and announces, I'm gonna be a da. Me da, who'd been holding his pipe to his lips, jumps to his feet and all eyes turns to him. He exchanges a glance with Grandma Sarah, then slowly sits back down. Then all eyes turn to me. At first, Nobody spoke. They all just sat there staring. Straightening herself, great-great-grandma Elizabeth Ann asks, With little Anne Margaret? As I nod, my da turns to his father with a raised brow, as if to ask if he had any words of wisdom. But no, old John Willemai just sat there with his eyes bugged out. Seeing he were no help, da takes a deep breath and sighs. Well, lad, as elated as I am, I'm fairly certain Bartholomew will no be sharing me elation. Thrusting a finger in the air, I exclaims, and therein lies the problem. Indeed, an unfortunate and unavoidable one at that, me da points out. The question is, how do you wish to proceed? I shouts, I haven't a clue. Just then me grandma asks, about what exactly? Having the baby or handling Bartholomew? Flare in me chest, I says. Oh, we're having this baby. Bartholomew'll be damned. Hear and what she needed to hear, she smiles a nod of approval. Then, with his Oxford vocabulary on full display, me da expounds. So, the problem is, you're not sure how to handle an acrimonious excuse for a father. Exasperated, I shouts. Precisely! Ma shakes her head, and with a mighty wave of her hand says, Well, I know what we'll not do. We'll not have our only son run through by a cantankerous, ill-tempered, miserable excuse for a man. Robert, we've to do something. Sounding like an Oxford law professor, Maida pulls the pipe from his lips and says, I'm recounting me previous statement. Well, I didn't know what the hell he were saying, so I says, Re what? Removing the pipe from his mouth, he shakes his head at me and says, What I mean to say is, I may have spoken prematurely. I said dealing with Bartholomew is unavoidable. However, upon further review, I believe that's exactly what you need to do. Confused, I asked. You mean, avoid him? Pointing his pipe at me, he snarls. Precisely. But how? He lives right bloody there, I says, pointing out the window. Da peers at me grandparents, then back at me through sinister eyes and snickers. You know, lad, another word for avoid is escape. Knowing him like they do, me grandparents exchange a look, and me grandma says, The box? Precisely. And just like that, grandma stands and scurries into the back room without a word. Moments later, she reappears carrying a small wooden chest covered with metal strapping and rivets. Me ma asks, Elizabeth, are you sure? Grandma Lizzie nods, then places the chest on the table in front of me and says, It's no much, but it should hold you over until you find work. And that's when it hits me. Everything I ever knew were about to change, and I whisper, are you saying we should leave the shire? Me da replies, We mean you should elope. With a deep breath, John Willemai raises a finger and sighs. Seems to me, with a slap of her palm to the table, his wife cuts him off. Tis the only way. 
Then turning to me, she says, Tell me, lad, have you a better idea? The roll of her eyes said me face told her all she needed to know, which is to say, I were clueless. Chuckling, Sarah and RJ exchange a glance. So, you think that's funny, do you? Senior retorts. His outburst brings the others to join in on the laughter. With a raised brow, Senior waits for their laughter to subside, then leaning forward he whispers, That's when me ma took me hand and says, James, you're our only son, and we'd hate to see you go. But, me da says, cutting in, we'd rather see you go and live happily elsewhere than stay here and face the wrath of Bartholomew. From across the table, me grandma bays, Your da's right, lad. You two will never be happy so long as that worthless dog is around. That's when me granda chimes in, saying, As much as I hate to admit, I think they're right, lad. That man will never relent. If you stay, you'll face his wrath in perpetuity. And that, James, is no way to live. With a squeeze of me hand, Ma says, And it's no way to raise a child, either. Just then, young Lizzie cuts him off. Grandpa? Senior peers across the table and with the patience of a saint replies, Aye? Softly she asks, Were the baby me da? Smiling warmly he replies, No, darling, your da came much later. Struggling to remember where he left off, Senior pauses with a finger to his lip. Thrusting the finger into the air he continues, So, there I were with no bloody idea where I'm going or how the hell I'm to get there. That's when John Willemai finally gets a word in, saying, Word is, there's work for young men in Ireland. It's work you can do, James, and you'll never have to worry about old Bartholomew again. Ireland, I gasp. There's a ferry out of Liverpool. It'll take you to Dublin, and you can be there in just a few days. The air fell clean out of me, and I feels an aching deep in me gut. I mean, it were a big leap, and yet, the more I thought on it, the more I knew he were right. In Ireland, Bartholomew would be out of me hair. But Ireland, what would Anne think? Well, I must have said that part out loud, because me ma slaps me hand and snaps. Son, that girl will follow you wherever you go. To the ends of the world, if need be. From across the table, Grandma says, Trust your mother, James. Anywhere you go, that's where she'll be. Just then, Ma squeezes me hand again, and when I looks at her, something in her eyes tells me our time together is growing short. And when I glances at me Granda, I can tell he were feeling it too. With his pipe clenched to his teeth and wisps of smoke, Often from his lips, Da says, Leaving home is never easy, son. I still remember how I felt when I left for Oxford in thirty-seven, and, and white as a ghost and twice as scared he were, billows John Willemai. Da gives him an eye roll and says, That's true, but I learned and I grew, and everything worked out. Pointing his pipe, John Willemai snickers, Just like I said it would. While they were yapping, me mind were racing. I found myself staring right past them like they weren't even there. In a trance, me eyes drifted to the chest. I were completely lost to me thoughts when I hears me grandma say, Well, go on. Snapping out of it, I glances at her, then back at the chest. Reaching down, I unlocks the clasp and lifts the lid. And what should I find? But six small pouches, five of them leather and filled with the king's shillings, while the sixth, a far smaller and more delicate pouch, held something far more precious. Although at first glance, I guessed it were empty. I flashes my grandma a grateful smile, and she says, Well, don't just sit there, you silly goose. Open the small one. So... I plucks the tiny pouch from the chest and loosens its strings. Then, ever so carefully, I turns it upside down and lets the contents fall into me hand. And when I brought it to me eyes, I were astonished. Leaning in, she whispers, It belonged to me mother. 
in a state of shock, I say. Tis beautiful, for in me hand lay an elegant gold ring, upon which two tiny hands were perched, each hand tenderly holding the other, beautifully framed by two delicate flowers. I tell ye, save me, lovely Anne, never had I seen anything so precious. Excitedly, she says, look here. Taking the ring, she carefully unclasps the hands, separating the rings, each adorned with a tiny hand and a delicate flower. As Senior describes the ring, Sarah removes her wedding ring, holding it up for all to see, for Grandma Anne had bequeathed it to her upon her passing. She follows along, separating the rings and showing them to the children as Senior continues to describe it. And what do you know? when at the center of the ring appears two tiny gold hearts resting side by side. Peering up from the ring with what I'm certain were a look of stunned disbelief, I sobs. How can I ever thank you? Then, and I'll never forget it, me grandma smiles at me so warm and sincere and says, James, take Anne away from here to somewhere safe, somewhere she can have your baby and you can live good lives together. That's all we ask. James Sr. pauses to look around the table while throwing a hand over his mouth, fake yawning. Oh, my! Tis getting late. I should let you run off to bed now. He lets his words fly, then sits back and waits for their reaction. James the Third is the first to take the bait, pleading, No, Grandpa, please don't stop. I love this story. Begging, Lizzie whines, Please don't stop. Cunningly, Senior retorts, But it's such a long story. Perhaps I should finish tomorrow. Protests fly from all sides of the table. It's too early for bed. I'm not even tired. Please don't stop. Tell us more. Please, 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 please. Sarah wipes her hands on her apron, then slowly raises them to shush the room. Senior. For all we know, tomorrow we never come. After all, tis Christmas. Won't you please continue? Da, you surely cannot stop now, not when you've just got us all thinking about the ring, R.J. adds, throwing Sarah a wink. Returning the gesture, Sarah flashes R.J. a glimpse of the gold ring with a seductive air kiss. R.J. catches it with a devilish grin. With the shrug, Senior replies, very well, but only if you insist. Now, where were I? Ah, oh, as promised, I went to meet with Anne later that day. Kneeling beneath the mighty oak at the edge of the river Dwent, I spied across Bartholomew's farm, keeping a sharp eye for me sweetheart. Not twenty minutes goes by when I spot Sir exiting the barn. Leaping to me feet, I press me fingers to me lips and gives her a whistle the likes of which I'm certain were heard in Nottingham, for as it pierces the air, every dog in the shire gets to barkin. Shading rise, and spins around and spots me under the old oak. Peering to her left and right, she checks to see it's clear, then waves to me. I point upstream to the doldrums. She nods and slips out of sight. Moments later, we meet up at our favorite spot by the river. And... If I'm telling it like it happened, and I will, on account of your ma's favorite part. Sarah sighs. Tis just so romantic. Senior points at her with his pipe and winks. For when we came together, we fell into each other's arms. Hugging her doll, Lizzie sighs. So beautiful. Senior winks at her, whispering. As are ye. Blushing, she gives her dolly a big hug. Straightening himself, Senior queries. So, where were I? Swaying back in his chair melodramatically, James the Third breathes. Falling into each other's arms. Senior points at him. Aye, indeed we were. So, there I am, holding her close like there's no tomorrow. But I could tell she were already at the end of her rope. With her head pressed against me chest, I could hear her softly weeping. With grim desperation in her voice, she says, 
I don't know how much longer I can keep this up, James. Me mother's already getting suspicious eyes. Well, I knew I had to do something, so I put on a brave face and says, Not to worry, I have a plan. And if and you're with me, you'll need no endure a moment longer. She tilts her head at me, and with a wicked scowl barks, Well, don't just stand there. Tell me. So, that's what I did. I took a deep breath and let it out. Tis really quite simple. All we need do is elope. Elope? Have you lost your mind? No. In my defense, I says, Uh, maybe. Chuckles erupt when Senior makes a funny face. Now here's the thing. And Margaret Yeoman may have been a farm girl, but she were a savvy lass. And at that moment, I could see in her eyes the wheels were turning. Straightening herself, and in a scolding tone, she snaps. James, we've no money, nowhere to go, and no bloody way to get there. How are we to elope? Throwing me hands up in surrender, I says. Now I understand why you might be thinking that, but hear me out. Glaring at me, she shifts her weight to her right leg and crosses her arms with the raised brow. Now I know that look, and what it's telling me is, she's no buying what I'm selling. Desperate to convince her, I says, hear me out, love. First, don't worry about the money. Me grandparents gifted us enough to get started. Oh, and remember our old cow, Lula? With a shit-eating grin, Senior leans forward, chuckling. I think I said that through squinted eyes. His sons shake their heads, laughing. Frustrated, she lets out a sigh and moans. My lord, James, not the kicker, I says. Ah, uh, yup, that be the one. And she's all ours, a wedding gift from me parents. A gift, she huffs. And what are we to do with the kicking cow? I smirks. Why, sell her, of course. Sell her? Why, sure, on our way to the coast. The coast, she gasps. Saying she were overwhelmed, I quickly shared the rest of me plan, praying she'd understand. I says, if and we head to the coast, me granda says there's a ferry in Liverpool that can take us to Ireland. Liverpool? Ireland? James, I've never even seen the ocean let alone Ireland. At this point, it's fair to say things were no going the way I envisioned, and the next words that fell from me mouth were no bloody help, when like a fool I says, "'Tis no the ocean, love, tis the Irish sea. Oh, the words no sooner left me lips when she spins around screeching, "'The what?' The family bursts into laughter, and probably because she is so much like Grandma Anne, all eyes turn to Sarah as they laugh. Being the edget that I am, I continued hanging myself when I says, "'Tis no ocean, tis the Irish Sea. Oh, if eyes were daggers. Desperate to save myself, I says, "'The beauty is, I've never seen it either. Think of it, it'll be a first for the both of us, our first great adventure together.' All she did were stare at me through the tops of her eyes, and I got a little nervous. Stammering, I says, and in just a few days hence, we could be starting anew in Ireland. Exasperated, Anne throws her hands to her head, staring across the waters of the river to went rolling swiftly by. I paused for a moment, assessing the situation. Then, as her hands fall to her sides, I seizes the moment and drops down on a knee. Taking her hand, I says, Anne. She looks down at me, her precious face drowned in a despair. I were gazing up at her like a puppy when she realized what I were doing. I can still remember the moment her baby blues softened. Tiny pulls welling up, escaping down her rosy cheeks to the left and right. Keeping me head, I retrieved the ring from me trousers, and like Prince Charman, I says, Anne Margaret Yeoman, you know I have loved you for as long as I can remember. So, I'm asking, will you be me bride, have me babies, and make me the happiest man in Ireland? When I touched the ring to the tip of her finger, 
I look up to find her cover in her mouth, her eyes tenderly watching. Her body trembles as I slide the ring on her finger, and she falls to her knees into me arms. Gazing at the ring with her head on me chest, she sighs. Oh, James. Senior looks over at Sarah to find her weeping. They lock eyes, and Senior continues. It were me grandma's. Me grandma wants you to have it, and pass it to the next generation. Gazing at the ring in awe, and breathes. I'm honored by her faith in me. Tis truly a blessing. And yes, I will proudly pass it to the next generation. Chuckling, I says. Does that mean you'll have me? With the reflexes of a fox, she lunges at me and lays a big wet smacker on me lips. Oh, and a mighty fine one it were, too. For had she no been holding me face with both hands, I may have fallen over backwards. Interrupting, Sarah comments. And that's when you know. Senior gives her a wink, then continues. As she pulled away, and I'll never forget it, she whispers to me, James, I'm yours, forever and always. Wiping tears, Sarah murmurs, So beautiful! It certainly is, R.J. says, rubbing his wife's back. Clearing his throat, Senior says, All great stories have a hint of romance, do they know? With a big smile, Lizzie gives Senior a thumbs up. He gives her a nod and continues. Later that night, with the ring hanging from her neck, and sneaks out of her parents' house. With no more than a small bag of clothes, she quietly slips across the barnyard and through the fields like an escaping prisoner. Meanwhile, inside me parents' house, we were all waiting on pins and needles, praying she'll arrive soon, when through the door she bursts. As we let out sighs of relief, Ma cries, Oh, thank God, we've been worried sick. Throwing an a wink, John Willemai billows. Not me, lass, I never had a doubt. Anne smiles at him, then turns to me Ma and says, I'm sorry, me Ma were lying in bed, but I think she were only pretending to sleep. And me da, he were passed out, drunk by the fire. It were all I could do to sneak away. Removing the pipe from his lips, Da stands up, arms stretch wide. Oh, that's behind you, Anne. You're safe now. Welcome to the family. Oh, me heart just melted when he said that, Senior sighs, hand over heart. Then he takes her in a warm embrace, as if she were his own daughter. It were truly a sight to behold. Still in his arms, she whispers, Thank you, Da. Wiping a tear from his nose, Senior murmurs, It were beautiful, I tell you. The next thing I know, Ma comes swooping in for a hug of her own, shoving Da aside while gently sliding her hand over Anne's belly. As she's rubbing her belly, Ma bursts into tears. Wrapping each other in another hug, they share a good cry. And before you can shake a stick, me grandma joins in, and now the three of them are crying. As Grandma joins their embrace, Anne whispers to her, Thank you for the ring. I shall cherish it always. Grandma reaches up, gently cupping Anne's face in her hands and whispers, As we cherish you, dear. Stepping away from Anne, Ma looks me in the eyes and says, Just remember what we taught you, James, and you'll be fine. Remember who you are and where you came from. And most of all, know that we love you and we're proud of you. Sniffing I says, I will, Ma. I love you, too. Slapping me chest, she barks. You'd better. As she steps away, Da hands me a deerskin bag, saying, Tis filled with your clothes and other such things, including some scones. I take the bag and sling it over me back. He retrieves something from his backside and places it in me hand. From the moment the sheath hit me hand, I knew what it were, and I says, But this is your favorite knife. He winks and says, Something to remember me by. You just never know when you'll need it. Wrapping me hands around the knife, I lift me shirt, placing it under me belt in the front of me trousers. With it neatly tucked away, I pets it twice with me hand and says, Thanks, Da. Moments later, 
Anne and I are standing in the doorway, light from the fireplace casting its flickering glow upon us as we gaze into the smiles of my loved ones one last time. I can still see him standing there, me granda with his arm around Grandma Lizzie's shoulder, and me da standing there with me ma softly weeping on his chest. I'll never forget it. And for a brief moment there were silence, during which Da gives me a nod like he knows we're going to be fine. Smiling, I return the nod, then turn and head for the barn. Minutes later, as we're walking Lula from the barn, Anne and I stop to take one last look around. Through the darkness, I can see them all standing on the front porch in the distance, the glow from the fire outlining their silhouettes as we leave the shire forevermore. With a slap of his knee, Senior says, The end! Standing in her chair, Lizzie whines, Don't stop! What happens when you leave the Shire? Surely that's when the adventure really begins, James III cries. Senior sighs, True enough, lad, but that's a story for another day. Now, give me a hug. Clapping her hands, Sarah stands to her feet, shouting, Senior's right, children. Time for bed. Good story, Da, James Jr. says with a hug. Good story, Grandpa, little John coughs. Tossling his hair, Senior gives him a mighty bear hug and growls. Why, thank you, little man. Maybe I can tell the part about the cow on New Year's Eve. I would like that. Good night, William says, kissing the back of Senior's head. Good story, Grandpa. See you in the morning, lad. Good night, all, R.J. and Sarah call as they make their way to their fifth-floor suite. Just then, little John approaches them. Ma, I don't feel so good. Wrapping an arm around him, Sarah feels his cheeks and forehead. All right, you're in our room tonight. Up you go. As James the Third and Lizzie head down to their second-floor rooms, William stops on the landing with Senior and asks, Shall I walk you up? Nay. <laughs> "'Tis but one floor. I'm fine. Thank you, lad. Are you sure? Sure as I'm standing here. Listen, lad, I may be old and wore out, but I ain't dead yet. So, run off the bed with you. I'll see you in the morn. All right, then. Good night, William replies as he watches Senior climb the stairs to the fourth floor. Passing William on the landing, James Jr. says, "'Sleep well, lad. There's much to do in the morn.' Following him down the stairs, William replies, Will do, Uncle James. See you in the morn. When they reach the second floor, William heads into his room, and James Jr. continues down the stairs and out to his cottage.